It ain't nothing I can do with it. Praise <laughs> God. Lord have mercy. Woo! Hallelujah. I got my sinuses all messed up. And uh, I've always wanted him to do that in person. I appreciate that. We've got a little group there in our church, these two sisters. And uh, <clears throat> their mom and daddy and grandpa taught them how to sing, and, and they're pretty good. Now they're teaching. They're little girls, 10, 12 years old. Another Sunday morning, right before I preached, and the little girls, the third generation, they said, we're going to sing this song, and they did your song, A Room with a View. And man, it got on. And I pastor a dignified church, but it got on. And brother, son, it was, you ought to see them city slickers when they get happy. They don't know what to do. They try to keep their makeup from running. And I like that right there. And, but praise God. And I, I, I just thought about it a while ago, looking out the window, boy. You see, oh, there's Daddy. Yeah. Oh, there's your preacher that led you to God. Yeah. Yeah. And all over oh, there's Jesus. Yeah. Somebody said, I sure hope I'll be able to find him. You'll have no problem. You just listen out, all that shouting and singing, and look in the midst. And that word midst means right smack dab in the middle. And that'll be him, the Lamb of God. Praise God. This is good. Hey, some of our dry churches don't know what they're missing. God is good. Hallelujah. Turn to somebody beside of you and say, praise God, I'm saved. And if you're not, you ought to be. And if you want to, you can be. Glory. 1 Corinthians chapter number 16 tonight. My dear brother that preached this morning, I thought, he's going to get on this, he's going to get on this. And God said, you and him both need to preach this. The Lord laid this on my heart several, several weeks ago. And as a little phrase I want to lift out and preach tonight. Man, I love the Bible, don't you? And I, I not only love it because it's true, but it's beautiful. I mean, the language of this Bible is absolutely beautiful. For instance, you're not going to improve on this. And without controversy, great is the mystery of God. How that God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. Man, that's pretty, ain't it? What about this? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go to a prayer place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there, you may be also. Well, ain't that beautiful? What about this? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Well, that's pretty, ain't it? I mean, what about this? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever whoop, be with the Lord. I love it because it is true and I love it because it is beautiful. And there's a phrase tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. In the sixth verse that when I read it, man, it jumped all over me. I can't get it out of my soul. And I want to preach on this phrase tonight from this text. Notice what Paul says tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse number 6. Paul said to the church at Corinth, It may be that I will abide with you, yea, and winter with you. And watch this little phrase now and say it with me. 
that ye may bring me on my journey, whithersoever I go. And I'm interested in that little phrase, that ye may bring me on my journey. He didn't say push me, drive me, pull me, but that you may bring me on my journey. And that little phrase there was a guide's term. It's a guide who has the traveler by the hand. And he is walking with him and helping him and staying with him, making sure that he reaches his destination. Paul said, God is going to put you and has put you in my life to hold me by the arm and hand and not push me and not pull me and not drive me, but to bring me on my journey, walk with me through my journey, stay with me through my journey to make sure that I reach the destination. Ma'am, this thought hit me. If I'm bringing somebody on their journey, I get to go too. Amen. And if I'm going to stay with them till they reach their destination, I'm going to get to go to the same place they are. Amen. But aren't you glad for people that God puts in your life? Not to drive you, not to push you, not to pull you, but to take you by the heart and hand and bring you upon your journey. Every time I think of that phrase, I'm reminded of that poem all of us grew up with about the footprints in the sand. How the man died and he went to heaven and he looked back over his life and there were two sets. And he asked the Lord, he said, why are there two sets of footprints in the sands of time? And the Lord said, oh, my child, one is yours and the other one is mine. I have walked with you all of the days of your life. But the man noticed when he came to a dark place, when he came to a hard place, there was only one set. And he looked up at the Lord and said, Lord, why did you leave me in the hard place? And why did you leave me when I needed you so much? Why are there only one set in the difficult places? And the Lord said, my child, oh, my child, that one set, they're not yours. They're mine. He said, that's when you were so weary and weak that you could not walk. So I picked you up and I carried you through. All of us tonight have a journey. But I'm glad we're not abandoned. I'm glad we're not forsaken. I'm glad we're not alone. Because God has put us in each other's life to bring us upon our journey. Notice who is saying this tonight, Brother Paul. And notice what he means by that phrase, my journey. When you think of that, my journey of the life of Paul, you think of this. There were trials that he had to face. If you want to know if Paul's real or not, go home tonight and read 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, where Paul enumerates all the things that he had to go through. As Paul strolls down memory's lane to remind the people that it has not been an easy road. In 2 Corinthians 11, you'll read phrases like this. Paul said, I was stoned. I was beaten with stripes. I was beaten with rods. I've been in peril on the land and on the sea by my countrymen, by thieves, and by robbers. He says, I know what it is to be cold and naked and hungry and abased. And besides all of these things that was upon me daily, the care of the churches. But yet at the end of Paul's life, he could say, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, and I kept the faith. Even though there were trials he had to face. He did not quit. He did not give up. He did not go AWL. He did not go back because God put people in his life not to pull him and push him and drive him, but to take him by the heart and hand and bring him upon his journey. 
there were trials that he had to face. That little phrase, my journey of the life of Paul, it talks about the task that he had to finish. Here is a man that God had called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Here is a man that God had saved and God had called and God had put him out on the front lines of the battlefield. He had a course that he had to run. He had a message that he had to preach. He had churches that he had to start. He had revivals that he had to hold. He had sinners that he had to win to Christ. He had books that he had to write. He was going to leave his footprints in the sands of time because the task that was laid before him. But he realized this. He was not alone. He was not forsaken. He was not abandoned. There was somebody there to catch his vision and catch his burden and hold him by the heart and by the hand and bring him upon his journey. There were trials that he had to face. That was a task that he had to finish. But that little phrase, my journey, there were thorns that he had to feel. Here is a man that not only knew what emotional stress was like and spiritual stress was like, but he knew what physical pain was like. And that thorn that was in Paul's side was a real thorn. It was not a make-believe thorn. It was a thorn that caused trouble and trial and pain. But yet Paul said, I found in the weakest moment of my life that when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You take a man's mind that has not been illuminated by the Holy Spirit, they, they do not understand that verse. That sounds contradictory. That sounds crazy to them. How in the world can you be weak and yet be stronger? I'll tell you why. Because when you're weak in your strength, you're strong in God's strength. When you're weak in your power, you're strong in God's power. When you're weak in your wisdom, you're strong in God's wisdom. Because sometimes we come to the end of ourselves and we don't know what to say and what to do and where to turn. But God sends somebody by and a dose of special grace and sufficient grace and save in grace and sustaining grace and supplying grace and it takes us by the heart and by the hand and it brings us upon our journey. We're not home yet. We've not got to that room with the view yet. But praise God, we're on our way. But we're not abandoned. We're not forsaken. We're not alone. Praise God. God and the Holy Ghost and the blood of Christ is walking the valley with us in Fighting the battle with us. And God is by the heart. And God is by the hand. And it's going to bring us upon our journey. That ye may bring me upon my journey. I'd like to call Paul to the platform tonight. I'd like to have a personal interview with Paul tonight and say, Paul, when you made this statement that God was going to put people in your life to bring you upon your journey did you have anybody particular in mind? And I believe Paul would say, yeah, let me tell you a few people that brought me upon my journey. Number one, I'm thinking of a fellow by the name of Barnabas. Paul, why do you love Barnabas? I can hear Paul say, but Brother Joe, you may not know my testimony. But let me tell you real quick, I've not always been the Apostle Paul. I've not always been Brother Paul. In fact, Brother Joe, before I got saved, I was a booger. I was a mean old rotten sinner. He said, in fact, the matter, I said this in one of my letters, I'm the chief of sinners. I killed Christians. I devoted the first part of my life to stamp out Christianity in his infant state. And one night, Brother Joe, on the road to Damascus, I had the papers in my hand to kill some more Christians and tear up some more churches and wreak havoc in the church of God. But what happened, Paul? Well, Brother Joe, something like this. I went out a fight, but oh my, that night, something got a hold of me. 
What was it, Brother Paul? He said, a light shone down from heaven. God knocked me off of my high horses. And I went down a sinner and I came up a saint. I went down a persecutor and came up a preacher. I went down a critic and came up a champion. I went down a slanderer and I came up a soldier. Oh, if anybody could say it with power. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Paul didn't get psychoanalyzed. He didn't turn over a new leaf. He didn't get a dose of man-made religion. He was transformed by the power of God. He was changed by the power of God. And brother, when Paul got saved, heaven got glad and hell got mad. You realize what God did when He saved Paul? He reached in the devil's toolbox and broke his best saw. Tore the handle out of his best hammer. Dulled his best screwdriver. Because Paul had been used so much in the hands of Satan to wreak havoc in that early church. But God has blessed him. And God has changed him. And God has saved him. And Paul was a newborn babe. He's a newborn believer. He found a new life in Christ. And oh, when word got out that Saul of Tarsus had been saved, them fundamentalists said, I'll never believe that. It ain't no way. They must have been a bunch of Calvinists that think nobody was saved but them. I don't believe that. Why, just the mention of his name brought fear to them women and them children. Why, that's the man that murdered their moms and dads. That's the man that had murdered their sons and daughters. That's the man that had given his life to wreak havoc in the church. And you mean to tell me he's been saved? Yep, I mean to tell you he's been saved. And the same grace and the same blood and the same mercy that saved the Apostle Paul is the same blood and the same mercy that still saves sinners tonight. Son, when word got out that Paul had been saved, nobody believed it. And nobody at the church would fellowship with him. They wouldn't even open the doors of the church the day Saul, who became Paul, paid them a visit. Oh, but that was a good brother by the name of Barnabas, whose name just happens to mean son of consolation. And one day he went on visitation, and he went to Saul of Tarsus and said, Saul, I know you are mean, pitiful, deplorable, wretched, ugly, wicked <laughs> sinner. Paul, did you trust Christ? Did you plead the blood? Did you call upon the name of the Lord? Why, you are my brother. And Barnabas puts his arm around Paul. And he puts his soul around Paul. And he said, come with me, baby Christian. Come with me, young believer. I'll bring you upon your journey. And Paul goes up there to Jerusalem at the first church and says, Hey, y'all, get off of your high horses and swallow your stinking pride. God has saved this brother. Grace has changed this brother. He's our companion. He's our brother. You ought to be glad God's still saving Gentiles. God's going to bless him. God's going to use him. God's going to touch him. Open your heart to this man. Open your arms to this man. He's our brother. He's going to be a blessing to us. He's going to be an encouragement to us. And on the word of Barnabas, they let Paul in the family of God. Oh, aren't you glad when you was a baby Christian and you first got saved, you didn't know all this about the Bible. You didn't know everything about church. But God, hallelujah, put somebody in your life not to drive you and beat you, but to love you and pray for you. And they brought you on your journey. Most of us that 
Grew up in church, had a head start. I mean, I went to church nine months before I was born. If you didn't get that, Dr. Parsons will explain it at the end of the service tonight. My daddy was an old-fashioned leather lung preacher, and my mama was an old-fashioned leather lung shouter. My mama's been a Baptist for 60 years, and she'll still do that mm, when, she, mm, when she gets happy. I like it myself. Man, I had a godly mother. I had a godly, honey, when you shouted a while ago, five minutes before you shouted, your dad looked at me, she said, he said, uh-oh, we're in trouble. It's just hit her. He said, she's going to shout here in a minute. Shout like my mama. Well, I thank God for my heritage. I thank God for my heritage. And listen to Brother Joe Arthur. Put this on a board. Sell it down at the flea market when I'm dead. That's my quote for the 21st century. I will not mock. I will not degrade. I will not trade off my spiritual heritage. I'd rather be an old time Christian than anything I know. Hallelujah. I am not ashamed of my heritage. But everybody didn't start out like we did. There's people that got saved. They're the first one in their family to trust Christ. They didn't know the books of the Bible. They didn't know the standards of the Bible. They didn't know how to tithe. They didn't know how to dress. They didn't know how to go to church. All they knew was what that blind feller said. What happened to you, sir? He said, the details are still kind of fuzzy. But this one thing I know. Whoop! I was blind, but now I see. They've just been saved. They don't know what we know. They've not been where they've been. And somebody needs to bring them on their journey. Hey, Barnabas, did you write any books of the Bible? Nope, but he did. <laughs> Barnabas, did you make three missionary trips and start churches in Asia and sooner or later they sailed the waters and came to America? No, but he did. Barnabas, have they named sons after you for the last 2,000 years? Not many, but a whole bunch of them been named Paul. How would you like to be Barnabas sitting in your room with a view clipping coupons off of Paul? Oh, can I say that one more time? Whoop! How would you like to be Brother Paul sitting in your room with a view, clipping coupons off of Brother Paul? I believe he's glad he invested in his life. And let me encourage you, when God reaches down and saves somebody, it don't matter what they look like, what they've been involved in, how long they've been involved with them, if they meet Jesus and get regenerated by the Holy Ghost and washed in the blood of the Lamb, they're as saved as we are. They're going to the same heaven. They've got the same Jesus. They've got the same Holy Ghost. And instead of judging them and beating them and condemning them, grab them by the heart and by the hand and bring them on their journey. I wonder if there's anybody here tonight, you're glad when you was a baby Christian. God put somebody in your life I got a friend of mine, and I love him dearly. He has his prayer meeting on Thursday. And I told him a while back, I said, one day God's going to open your eyes, and you're going to have it on Wednesday like they had it in the Bible. I said, why do you have it on Thursday? He said, we got my visitation on Wednesday. I said, why do you have visitation on Wednesday? He said, you'll be surprised to do we find home on Wednesday night. I said, no, I wouldn't. I pastor a Baptist church. I wouldn't be surprised till you find it home Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and revival night. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on Wednesday night, he said, door knocking. And said, this old boy come to the door. Looked like son, he fell out of a tackle box. I mean, he was a woolly booger. And my buddy got to talking to him and witnessing to him. And he saw him begin to cry. He said, did you just say... Did you just say you love me? And the boy said, nobody has ever said that to me before. 
To make a long story short, he whipped up that soul winner's New Testament. Took him down that Roman's road. I like it. All roads lead to Calvary. And he got saved. Man, he got born again. My friend said, hey, what you doing tomorrow night? He said, nothing. He said, we have prayer meeting on Thursday night. We keep water in the baptistry all the time. Come on and follow the Lord in baptism. He said, I'll be there. My friend said, I don't know to this day what made me do that. I said to this guy, you got any talent? Do you do anything you can do in church? He said, yep. I played a guitar and sang. My friend said, oh, man, that's awesome. Do you, do, 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 do you know any gospel songs? He said, yep. I know that one about angels. Now, look at here. If you grew up in North Carolina or South Carolina or Georgia and somebody tells you they played the guitar and sang and they know a gospel song about angels, automatically you think, oh, come angel band, oh, come around me. That's what you think about. Boy, my friend's pumped up. He said, this is going to be awesome. I'll let a God of Christ on Wednesday. I'm going to baptize him on Thursday. He's going to get from all in people and pray, play and say, this is going to send revival to our church. And he came out that night with that guitar. He said, now, boy, before I take you back here and baptize you, get up here and explore that God, son, and sing that song about angels. Boy, that old guy ain't been saved hardly 24 hours. He grabs that guitar, strokes that E chord, gets that microphone, and begins to sing. I didn't know God made honky-tonk angels. I, I might have known you'd never make a wife. And then he went into a course of kissing angels, good morning, and love her like the devil when you get my... Some of you know the words. Some of you are moving your lips. Some of you Missouri boys were moving your lips. You know the words. So my buddy, my buddy, my buddy jumped and said, wrong song, wrong song, wrong song. He said, come here, boy. He said, this is a hymn book. After I baptize you, I want you to see this hymn book. Let me go around the corner. Twenty-five years later, that man pastors his own church. And he's led thousands of people to Jesus Christ. Because when he made mistakes as a baby Christian, when he was an infant believer, when he first got saved, he didn't know a whole lot. He hadn't been anywhere. But God put somebody, hallelujah, in his life to take him by the heart and by the hand and he brought him on his journey that you may bring me listen we ought to just be glad God's still saving people we ought to be glad God's still saving people and he's saving sinners bad people, jacked up people, messed up people. But the same grace of God that made a difference in your life is the same grace of God that will make a difference in any man's life. Bring them upon their journey. Barnabas, don't be a critic. Don't be a spiritual judge. Be a Barnabas. Paul, let me ask you this. Anybody else you got on your mind? Paul, anybody else that God has used in your life to bring you upon your journey? And I believe Paul would say, yeah, come to think of it. There's another old boy I love and appreciate. Y'all heard him preach about this morning. Brother Onesiphorus. And Paul, uh, what do you appreciate so much about Onesiphorus? He said, well, Joe... Hell got mad at me when God saved me. Hell got really mad at me when I started preaching. And sometimes, Joe, they would beat my back. They would lacerate my back. And they would take me to a dark, damp, cold, rad, waste-infested prison cell and throw me in and lock the door. And the devil would come by and say, See, nobody cares. He said, but without fail, I was an old brother named Onesiphorus. You know what I loved about him, Joe? What, Paul? He was not ashamed <laughs> of my shame. Amen. Amen. That's good. Can I run a rabbit? Yeah. I want to thank God publicly for every person through my ministry that's not been ashamed Amen. of the way I preach and what I preach, and where I take my stand. 
I appreciate every preacher that's not been ashamed to have me in their church. I appreciate every saint that's not been ashamed to sit on the pew behind me at church. And I appreciate every believer that didn't walk out on me when I got to hollering and a spitting and a sweating. They were not ashamed. And I want to say, bless God, you ain't got nothing to be ashamed of. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the Bible. I'm not ashamed of the Holy Ghost. I'm not ashamed of a shouting saint. I'm not ashamed of an old time preacher. I'm not ashamed. You don't have anything to be ashamed of. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You know why it says let the redeemed of the Lord say so? Because we're the only ones that's got anything worth saying so. He was not ashamed. Woo! My shame. What did he do for you, Paul? You touched on it this morning. He said, he refreshed. Oh, I looked up that little word refreshed, and it's a seaman's term. As they would pull the boat into the harbor to replenish the supplies. Mm. They weren't home yet. Woo. And they had a few more storms and stormy gales to get through. But they would pull the boat into the little safe haven and they would replenish the ship. They would supply the ship. They would refresh the ship. In other words, they'd give them what they needed to make the rest of the journey. Lord God, how many times in your Christian life have you sailed through some stormy waters and some stormy gales, but you'd pull into somebody's port of blessing and port of encouragement and haven of rest, and they replenished your ship. They gave you what you needed to finish the rest of the journey. I'm not home yet. I'm not there yet. I got some more storms and some more winds and some more gales, but I've got you and you got me and we're going to pour ourselves in each other's life and give us what we need to finish the journey. He refreshed my spirit. Woo. Have you ever felt like quitting? Have you ever been discouraged? There's two types of people when it comes to discouraged. Those who have been discouraged and those who have been discouraged and lied about it and said they've never been discouraged. That's right. You live in the real world, you're going to get disappointed. You live in the real world one day, somebody's going to eat the marshmallows out of your, out of your lucky charms. They're going to lick the frost off your frosted flakes. They're going to do you like that girl did Barney on Andy Griffith. They're going to grab your snow cone and bite the bottom out and suck it all the syrup and leave you with nothing but the ice. <laughs> You're going to get down, man. You say, I ain't going to get down. Wait till you, one of your kids pull a stupid moment. Oh, mine pull a stupid moment. Mm. One lady said, why is my kid so stupid? I said, you're their mother. You, you, she didn't think it was funny like you did. Somebody said to my daddy one time, said, dear God, JB, why is your boy so mean? Daddy said, because he plays with your boy. You say, I've never felt bad, never disappointed. Wait, do you have a physical malady? And the devil turns it into an emotional trauma. I was preaching in Kingsport, Tennessee, went to bed that night like I do every night of my life. 4.30 in the morning, I woke up. And man, I had an excruciating pain in my abdomen, 104 fever. I was sick, man. I did the first thing that most men do. I don't know why I don't do any good. I call my wife. <laughs> uh, Julie, I'm sick. 
And she said, ha, ah, suck it up. Be a man. Pay your dues. You're going to be all right. <laughs> Let me tell every one of you young fellows in this room tonight, the last woman in your life to give you sympathy is your mother. Shout now, big boy. It'd be all right. <laughs> it's hard sometimes, ain't it? He means well, honey. I'm sick. The next day I flew home and I walked into the house and I looked like a ghost, man. She said, you're sick. I said, I'm trying to tell you. I don't lie about that. We got a normal home just like you got. Boy, I went to the hospital. By the time I got there, I dehydrated. I was hallucinating. I have been through nothing like that in my life. And, and, you know, and, and I heard the other day that there were people that they have this uh, emotional disorder that they're really not sick, but they love being in the hospital. You look at me. If you love being in the hospital and you're not sick, you're sick. I didn't like nothing about it. Number one, it's the coldest place I've ever been in my life. I found out something. If what you got don't kill you, you might catch double pneumonia in that place. But if that thing they give you to wear, Christians ought not to dress like that. And they don't care if you're Dr. Arthur from Harvest Tabernacle Church. Oh, no. They put that thing on me, put me in a wheelchair, roll me out front the front door like a Walmart greeter, and there I am trying my best to stay decent. This one guy came by me, and he's a-pulling, and I was a-pulling. I said, sir, I'm sorry. He said, me too. I just come to check the air conditioning. He wasn't even a patient. He wasn't even a patient. Huh. I'll tell you this, all them medical terms, I don't know where they got them from, but I don't know where they got that I see you from. You put one of them gowns on and turn around and somebody going to say, I see you. It's horrible. And then, Pastor Jason, to make matters worse, somebody went to hell and told the devil what room I was in. And then he went back to hell and got him some demons. And every night when my family would leave and my friends would leave, they'd pay me a visit. Walk around my bed and say, Shout now, camp meeting preacher. Rip one off now, glory boy. Tell a funny joke, make somebody laugh now, big shot. Preach one of your flaming sermons now, big boy. I got you. You'll never sing again. You'll never preach again. You'll never shout again. I stop you here. The last chapter of your life ends in this dirty hospital room. Right here's where it ends. And if you listen to that, the devil will take your mind in some old, dark, dead-end spots where there seems to be no relief. But this is what I love about the Lord. It wasn't too long. All oh, the door would open and the sun would come up and the door would open and in would walk one of them children from down there at the house of God. In would walk one of the brethren from the house of God. In would walk one of the members of the household of faith with a smile on their face and a glow on their face and a song in their lip and a Bible in their hand. And they'd come by and say, Love you, brother. Prayed for you this morning. I just heard 
word from heaven. And it's all right now. I know the valley's deep. And I know the mountain's high. And I know the river's wide. But come on, son. We'll climb the hill together. We'll swim the ocean together. We'll fight the devil together. I got you. You got me. I'm going to bring you upon your journey. Let me ask you, where would you be tonight without the saints of God? Where would you be tonight without the people of God? Where would you be tonight without God's church bringing you upon your journey? We couldn't make it. We couldn't make it. I'm thinking tonight of the pretty little old gal I have ever seen in my life. The most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. I'm thinking about her right now. Praise God, next month I'll be married to her for 33 years. And she's brought me upon my journey. I'm thinking about my little old dad. He's already in heaven. Jesus come got him the day after Thanksgiving 2008. He's up there woo, where this room would have you. I used to, Daddy used to say, Daddy couldn't sing Night of the Note, but he sung Night of the Cross. And one of Daddy's favorites, he said, I can hear him now. There's a city of light where there cometh no night. For the sun never sets in the sky. In the Bible we're told. That the streets of pure gold and a cool, gentle river runs by. And Mama joined him. I'm bound with the Woo! I'm bound. Woo! I'm bound for that city. God's whole. Woo! Hey! He's up there tonight in that room with a view saying, Boy, it's everything that I said it was. It's everything that I said it was. It's worth every mile of the trip. God used him in my life to bring me on my journey. I'm thinking of my little mama, that Elizabeth, my sister in Burlington, North Carolina. 83 years old. You could pick up my cell phone tonight and call her. What are you doing? I'm watching my boy preach. <laughs> and I'm praying for him. And I just want to warn you, if you ever meet my mama, don't you say nothing bad about me. She'll slap you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the sweet Holy Ghost. <laughs> my mama will whoop you and then get forgiveness later. She's a Baptist now. She can send get by with it. Can I get an amen right there? <laughs> Woo! She brought me upon my journey. Yes, sir. I'm thinking about Mays Jackson who told me, Boy, preach the Bible. You can preach anywhere. Take the high road. Be a gentleman. I like you got some sense. You can preach anywhere. He brought me upon my journey. And there's people in this room God has used through the years in my life to bring me upon my journey. None of us got here by ourselves. That's what you're saying this morning, son. More eloquent than I just said it, but man, none of us got here by ourselves. You'll put into a certain church and they'll pour it on you. You'll pull in some churches and they'll take it from you. You got to have them to keep you humble. Then you'll pull into some that'll just bring it on you. You'll go preach somewhere and somebody would say, My boy got saved while you was preaching it. They get ready to run the preacher off, and an old man stands up and said, Nope, he was at the hospital when I said goodbye to my wife. You ain't running him off. I'm standing for my preacher. I'm telling you, brother, if you invest your life in others and pour your soul in others and refresh others, when your time comes, when your turn comes to walk through the valley and swim the ocean and climb the river, God will put somebody in your life to bring you on your journey. We're not here by ourselves. But 
bring me upon my journey. I got another one. I won't go there, but go home and start about Aquila and Priscilla. A man and his wife, a couple for Christ that had invested in the life of Paul. They gave him a bed when he was sleeping. They gave him a meal when he was hungry. Oh, they gave him money when he needed it for his ministry. Boy, God used this man and his wife, Aquila and Priscilla, to invest their life in the Apostle Paul. And then I think back over not only the preachers in my life, but the preachers and their wives in my life that God has used. And you remember this tonight, God not only uses that preacher man, but He uses that preacher's man companion. They're a team for God. They weep together. They cry together. They work together. And they all will invest in to your life. But lastly, and I don't want to call Paul and say, Paul, is there anybody else God has used in your life to bring you on your journey? And I believe it's a, yeah, Joe, I'd be amiss if I didn't mention this one. Who is it, Paul? He'd say, oh, Brother Luke. Well, Paul, what do you like about Brother Luke? So good, said, he went with me to the very end. Joe, I ended my life in a cold, dark Mammothine prison. And he said, Joe, I'll be honest with you, I'm going to confess my human and my carnality. He said, I looked around, and Paul said, and at my first answer, I'm glad he admitted he was wrong on his first answer. And I want to say he's not by himself. A lot of us have been wrong a lot of times in our first answer. He said, in my first answer, I looked around and said, all men have forsaken me. But Joe, I was wrong. I looked through the dim lit cell and over there in the corner was old brother Luke. He said, Alexander the carpenter Smith had done pulled his stud. And Demas had done moved his letter to another church. But I looked, and in the shadows, all the way to death's door, was old brother Luke. He was still with me. By the way, you know what Luke was? A doctor. And anybody that's got their own personal doctor, you special. I got sick the other day and called mine. He said, I'm booked up for six months. I said, forget it, I'll be dead. <laughs> and I told my wife, put it on my tombstone if I die. Don't call him. He don't care. <laughs> but Paul, him the darkest, weakest, death-rattling moment, he had a doctor with him named Luke. You say, now, Brother Joe, all that sounds good, but how does all that bringing me on my journey stuff work out? Well, it worked out pretty good for Luke. You say, well, what did he go on to do? Really? Let's just have a little Bible study. The first four books of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark. Guess who got to write Luke? Luke. Guess what he wrote about? A compassionate Savior. Yes. A friend of sinners. Amen. The good Samaritan. Yes. Woo! The thief on the cross. Yes. Why do you think God let Luke write all of that? He gleaned from Paul while he's bringing him on his journey. You said, that ain't enough to convince me. Okay, let's have another Bible study. The first five books of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Guess who wrote Acts? Luke. Guess who you read about in Luke? Paul. What about Paul do you read about? How you got saved? Luke told us about Paul's conversion. Lord have mercy. If I wasn't so fat, I'd turn a cartwheel right here. God let Luke introduce to the world Brother Paul and how he got saved. You said, how did Luke know all 
about it. He learned it by Paul while he was bringing him on his journey. Woo! And that leads me to say this. If you'll bring somebody on their journey, you're not going to get left out. God will put somebody in your life to bring you on your journey. I'll be Paul, you be Luke. Luke, did I tell you about that time? Well, I was going to go over there and tear up that little old church and kill that preacher and his family. No, I went there to fight, but oh my, that night, something got a hold of me. Something got a hold of me, praise God. Something got a hold of me. I went there to fight, but oh my, that night, God got a hold of me. Amen. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. <laughs> Woo! Luke, did I tell you, God, I saw a light, son, and I fell on my knees, and I called him Lord. Lord, what will you have me to do? And son, you ain't going to believe this. He reached way below the bottom that night, and I got regenerated, and I got born again, and I got redeemed, and I got washed in the blood. I got sealed with the Holy Ghost. I got adopted into the family. Family. God changed my life. He called me to preach. Hallelujah. Have I told you about it? Uh, now I hear Luke say, yeah. Tell it again. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Luke, you tell him now, son. You tell him. You tell them now, boy. Woo! Especially my young preacher boy, Timotheus. Make sure he knows this. When I come to the river at in the end of day, when the last winds of sorrow have blown, there'll be somebody waiting to show me the way. I won't have, hey, you tell my boy Timothy that I thought everybody forsook me and I couldn't see you at first. But I tell him I said this, standing somewhere, whoo, how about to get drunk in her skunk? Tell him that standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. The Lord stood with me. And he delivered me out of the mouth of a lion. Tell him, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. And I kept the faith. And tell him, you saw me lay down the cross and pick up a crown. Oh, son, you tell him, by the time my juggler vein starts to wiggle, I'll have a new body. I'll have a new home. I'll be in glory waiting on Jesus to come. Hallelujah. He brought him home. On his journey. Woo! Hallelujah. God give him somebody. We need it in the most. And he brought him on his journey. It's quarter to ten. Oh, I'm on central time. <laughs> we got plenty of time. How many hated I didn't set my watch back? <laughs> Aren't you glad you're a little baby Christian? Yeah. Somebody said, come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. You remember when the Lord called you to preach? Yes, sir. Come on. Yes, sir. You got sick in body. Oh, we wept together. We preached together. We've shouted together. We've fought the battle together. Yes, sir. Now Jesus has come. Amen. And we've been called up together. <laughs> you ready? And we step inside the gate together. 
Glory. Woo! Boys, return to city. Return to city. Oh, there's mom and dad. Oh, there's the old preacher man. And hurry, boys. Oh, there's Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, aren't you glad one day we'll cross the finish line. We're going home to be with God. That you may bring me on my journey. I'm done, but let me just say this. You wrong, but I'm gonna agree with you. Okay, you wrong, but for the sake of our, I'm gonna agree with you. Nobody loves you. Nobody cares. You don't have a friend. You don't have anybody. You're all alone in my. Now you wrong, but for the sake of the argument, I'm gonna agree with you. And there's nobody down here that's been a blessing to you at all. You're wrong, but for the sake of the argument, I'm gonna agree with you. I'll tell you this. One day you'll make your last step on your journey. And you'll wake up in the arms and look in the face of Jesus. And I promise you, you'll say, thank you, Lord. You brought me on my journey. Lord, you picked me up and you carried me through. And you were so good. And you're so faithful. I didn't get here by myself tonight. Somebody brought me upon my journey. Thank God for that person in your life that brought you on your journey. Now you go be a bigger blessing to them as they were to you. And find you some struggling believer. Say, come on. I'm not going to pull you and I'm not going to drive you and I'm not going to push you. But together. <laughs> Hand in hand we walk each day, hand in hand along the way, walking thus I cannot stray, hand in hand with Jesus. Woo! Hey, glory! Turn to somebody sitting beside of you right now and say, Boy, you've been a blessing to me. You brought me on my journey. Thank you, brother. You brought me on my journey. Son, God's used you to encourage my heart. God ain't done with you yet. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, man. Come on. Let's take us a little stroll. Praise God. Hey, yeah. if God be for you, who can be against you? God is your Father. Hallelujah. Jesus is your yeah. Savior. The Holy Ghost is your Comforter. God's still there. Yeah. You've sang to people and encouraged them. And they brought you on your journey. It's not over yet. Amen. Now, a while ago, you didn't know what to do with it? I don't know what to do with it. I'm done. Bring me on my journey. Hallelujah. It's yours, son. Now you go do something.